Well, good morning. morning. We just we just got out of Romans just in time to get right back in. So today we're going to dig a little deeper into Romans 5, 5. And this suitcase is filled with probably close to 2,000 years of theological baggage. So I'm just going to leave it right here and uh, we'll, we'll come back to it. But let's leave it over there for a little bit if we could. Um, A couple of things stood out to me in the first time that Peter preached through this passage of Romans 5, 1 through 5. And I've talked with quite a few people who struggle with hope. Hope can be hard sometimes. Um, It can feel hopeless sometimes, ironically. And I used to struggle with it too, and I still do on occasion. So I was particularly interested in understanding this passage a little further. So I'd like to walk through it today with you. I'm more interested today in asking questions and making observations than I am in trying to teach you the specifics about the text. So if you'll walk with me, I appreciate that. So Romans 5, 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out, or has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, a couple of things stood out suffering producing endurance. I think, given the state of things in the world today, I don't probably have to unpack that too much for anybody. We know what suffering is, and we know how it leads to endurance. Endurance producing character still makes sense. What is endurance? It's the fact of or the fact or power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way. I like to think of a really easy visual, visual whether you're a runner or not, you've run before, so you can visualize this. If you were crazy enough to plan for a marathon, you would need to do some training leading up to the marathon. So those, those smaller runs would be building your endurance for the big unpleasant thing that we call a marathon. Um, so character producing hope was pretty interesting to me here. I, I don't think I ever stopped and really paused at that place to hear that properly, that character would produce hope. So is there no hope production if there's no character built? Um, I personally feel that character has been exploited by institutions in our world seeking to define it a way that's convenient for them. And there are no institutions I can think of that are exempt from this. Educational systems, both lower and higher, work to build character or define character the way that is useful to them. Institutional churches, whether they're Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, cults. Uh, Furthermore, religion, whether it's Judaism, Islam, Hindu, Buddhism, and governments, be them capitalist, communist, socialist, totalitarian, all interested in defining character for us. As a species, I feel like we often focus too heavily on defining and, and forcing the character that we desire to see instead of helping someone along the way as their character develops. We seem more focused on defining character, judging character, than helping someone develop character. More interested in telling people what good character looks like, what it is, and therefore what they should look like, than helping people identify and cultivate their own good character traits. Character traits or behaviors, if you will, are much easier to manipulate, judge, and expect. Endurance produces character. That's a journey for each of us. Jesus was uniquely gifted at walking the journey with others. It requires patience with yourself. It requires patience with others. Character development is not wind sprints. The impatience of today's society increasingly diminishes this concept. I think of the Seinfeld episode, if if you're 
old enough to remember it. The serenity now statement. It's, it's funny because you're demanding serenity now. I, I need it now. I want it now. Character now. We listen to a TED talk on character and we want character now. I don't have time to develop it. Character produces hope. No hope without character work. Well, then I got to hope does not put us to shame. And I was really curious to dig into what does that phrase mean, put us to shame. Well, let's define hope first. It's a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. But more importantly, there's an archaic definition of hope that we don't use so much today. You still hear it on occasion. It's one word. The archaic definition of hope is trust. It's expecting with confidence type of trust. You might hear it uh, in this way. I, your mother is doing well, I hope. Or another way to say it, I trust that your mother is doing well. I'm anticipating it. I'm expecting it. Hope in Christ is faith in our daddy. That faith, our hope, gives us peace that passes all understanding. Verses 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Peace that passes all understanding. This is peace from the Holy Spirit. This is mysterious. It's the mysterium. It's not understood. It passes all understanding. All means all. I know that we humans have a really tough time with that concept. It passes all understanding. I love Peter's stories, and I, I'm so thankful that he shares his stories he will always say when he starts his stories, don't make any sense or are uh, hard to explain because they are hard to explain. But I'm so thankful that he shares those stories from the Roman series. He, he shared quite a few and they're mysterious. They're, they're hard to believe for some people maybe because they're so hard to explain without experiencing them. But they're true. They're true for Peter. They're true for Susan. They're reality. It's, it's tempting sometimes to simply dismiss not having experienced it or anything like it yourself. But I know Peter well enough to know he wished he didn't have the ability to tell those stories sometimes. <laughs> that they had, they're just so hard to explain. They're so hard to understand. Maybe you have similar stories or maybe you have similar stories that aren't quite, don't seem quite as fantastical. Um, but uh, I just think that it's important to continue to share those stories that you have, the things that you bump into in life that are difficult to explain. We can really be tempted to ignore them or push them down or not talk about them so that we're not pushed out of the norm, right? We're not, um, we're not people don't turn away from us and say, well, he's clearly not all there. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting because when I was thinking about those stories, I was thinking about the fact that we have a spiritual realm around us that we're often not tuned into. And I thought it was, it was curious because I remembered studying at some point about our eyes and our brain. And I know that there are times when our eyes will just simply drop something out of the vision equation, not send it to the brain. It's there, but the eyes say, eh, we just can't deal with that right now. So just focus on, on forward and it'll just be over here. You know, it's not in your way, I don't think so. Um, and, and I looked into that a little bit and there is, there is a, a phenomenon called psychotic masking. It's also known as a visual psychotic suppression. Uh, it's the phenomenon in visual perception where the brain selectively blocks visual processing during eye movements in such a way that neither the motion of the eye, the subsequent motion blur of the image, nor the gap in vision perception is noticeable to the viewer. So if you look in a mirror, you'll never see your eyes move. You'll see them in a new place. In a new place, you'll never see them move. The eyes can never ob be observed in motion, yet an external observer clearly sees the motion of the eyes. 
The, the, the phenomenon is often used to help explain another phenomenon called a temporal illusion. And it goes by the name of chronostasis, which momentarily occurs following a rapid eye movement. Chronostasis is a type of temporal illusion in which the first impression following the introduction of a new event or task demand to the brain can appear to be extended in time. Really common uh, occurrence of this is when you look at a clock that has a second hand that's ticking the seconds away, when you first look at it, it feels like the second hand holds longer than a second, and then it starts ticking again. It was funny, Heather and I, when we went to the emergency room, well, that wasn't funny, but uh, they had a clock in there that was, it was designed for doctors for some reason, I don't know what, what the purpose is, but it jumped forward five seconds at a time, the second hand, so it would hold for a while, and then just kind of jump, which really threw us off. It looked weird. But uh, I, I think you, you notice this too when you go on a road trip sometimes. Like the first time you drive on a trip, it feels like forever. The next time you do it, you're like, wow, we're here already? This is, wow, this seemed like it took a longer time before. So I just thought I'd point those out. I think it's interesting that our bodies and our brains are able to deal with much more than we give them credit for sometimes, and sometimes they're not. They just kind of shut it out and say, hey, we'll, we'll get to that later, like Einstein did. Um, so let's unpack put to shame a little bit. I wanted to explore what Paul might mean by hope doesn't put us to shame. Through a series of observations and questions, if you'll walk with me through some insights, I looked up the Greek the Greek word is not something I can pronounce. It's used 13 times in the New Testament. It's used mostly by Paul. This is for put to shame, the Greek word for that. Uh, it's used mostly by Paul. Luke used it, and we will take a look at how he used it in a minute. But both Paul and Peter use it when quoting an Isaiah passage from Isaiah 28, verse 14. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. We heard this one a few times as we went through Romans. Well, Isaiah wasn't written in Greek, so put to shame does not appear in Greek here. It is not that Greek word. It is a Hebrew word. And that Hebrew word, kush, is, is defined generally as, or translated as, will not, so it's actually hastily, but in the context, it would be will not act hastily. So whoever believes in him will not act hastily or reactive or quick or panicked or stressed out. So let's look at Luke's use and see what we find there. And then we'll come back to Isaiah because I think they tie together pretty well. So in Luke 13, 10 through 17, Luke tells us a story about a woman with a disabling spirit. Now he, would be Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced in all the glorious things that were done by him. I think this passage is what real revival looks like, regardless of where it happens. It's the hope of Christ that's flowing through us in our world. It was the hope of God flowing through Christ into the world at that time. But in our space-time, it's the hope of Christ that flows through us to the world. You don't need someone to tell you what to do. You don't need a practical application. You, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit. It's telling you what to do always. Peter's timeline that we've seen time and time again. Um, 
The seventh day in, around, and through our space time. It enters into our world. It's here at hand. It's like we've been trained to look for the wrong types of waves in our world or something. Like we're looking for AM, FM waves, but what's coming through is coming through as microwaves. And we aren't noticing them because we're tuning in to AM, FM waves. I'm not hearing anything. Both are invisible to the naked eye, but both are very much here in our space time. We don't have to see them to prove it. Jesus tells us repeatedly that he was sent to do the work of his Father. But that work consistently contradicts what religious leaders think he should be doing. You don't need a practical application for an impractical work. What good would it do? Instead, surrender in faith. Be quiet and still and listen. Heather and I have been to the hospital recently. Uh, Neither one of us our favorite place, as you can imagine. But we did go to St. Anthony's, which was an interesting place. Um, It was actually a good experience. The surgical team that worked with Heather were such great listeners. The doctors listened. They heard her and understood her. And that meant a lot. There were some things that didn't make any sense in the hospital, right? That are embarrassing to talk about sometimes. But I'm going to talk about them anyway. Because they brought me comfort or they brought Heather comfort. Silly things. First, the mission of the, of the hospital. I found it everywhere. Everywhere they have their mission plastered in that building. Everywhere. And their mission is, we extend the healing ministry of Christ by caring for those who are ill and by nurturing the health of the people in our communities. They do daily prayer over the loudspeaker, hospital-wide, two times a day. Very comforting (laughs) for me. Might not have been for someone else, but it was for me and it was for Heather. Crucifix is in every room above the door. When we landed in the emergency room, or the emergency department, they call it now, I guess, um, we were in room seven, meant something to Heather. We were then transported to room 707 on floor seven. And small things, weird things, but comforting still, nonetheless, to us. Just little signs. Well, now let's jump back to Isaiah 28 for a better understanding of what Paul is referencing here. Paul, remember, had a deep understanding of the passage he is referencing from his previous career as a Pharisee, a persecutor of Christians. The prophet Isaiah in this passage has been charged with delivering a not-so-popular message to the ten tribes of Israel, referred to as Ephraim, who are about to be exiled. It's the first of a series of six woes in the book of Isaiah that conclude with an announcement of judgment on the nations and a song celebrating the joy of the redeemed. And the proud crown that we hear about in verse 1 is believed by some scholars to be Samaria, you might have heard of it, the capital of the northern kingdom. So Isaiah 28 reads as thus. Ah, woe to is missing from the ESV only for some reason. Ah, woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong like a storm of hail, a destroying tempest, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters. He casts down to the earth with his hand, The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley, will be like a first ripe fig before the summer. When someone eats it, he swallows it as soon as it is in his hand. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people, and a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. To whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk those taken from the breast, for it is precept upon precept, 
precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. 1 through 10 was directed toward the religious leaders. And then there's a small break. I, we skip a little bit of it there. Um, and Isaiah turns his attention, it's believed, to the civil leaders then from the religious leaders. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, you who rule this people in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line, and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and waters will overwhelm the shelter." Then your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it passes through, it will take you. For morning by morning, it will pass through, by day and by night, and it will be sheer terror to understand the message. For the bed is too short to stretch oneself on, and the covering too narrow to wrap oneself. Verse 20 is a common proverb from the time. It basically communicates uh, a, I need the right word, sorry, I lost my place. It, com it communicates something that's coming, something that's certain, I guess, is what I'll say. Um, it's going to happen, it's set in motion, an irremediable situation. So it's not all hopeless, that sounds hopeless. Right? But Isaiah, he, it, the, the passage does turn at verse 23. 23 starts with, listen and hear my voice. Pay attention and hear what I am saying. And from there, verses 24 through 29 use farming examples to explain what is coming. Is going to be both temporary for a time and it's going to be temporal which is worldly as opposed to spiritual. These people are then allowed to be overtaken by the Assyrian Empire, the most violent empire to date at that time. And still up there today, actually. <laughs> still, still pretty high on the violence scale. But I want you to remember, we're just observing and asking questions today. I'm not trying to interpret or teach this to you. Some questions are really difficult to wrestle with. Did God hand them over? Did God simply allow them to be handed over? Well, a lot of people have died over that discussion. And I'd like for all of us to make it out of here today. So I'll simply ask you this. Do you believe that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient? I do. But I also believe that we simply don't have enough information in our space time to properly process these questions in an educated way. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with simply saying, I don't know. My hope is in God, the Father of Christ, my Father, my Abba, my Daddy. My hope is not in the ability of mankind to understand or explain him. Well, Rabbi Saul, now the Apostle Paul, understood this story very well. It's Isaiah to the religious leaders of 700-ish BC. We hear the same message in Jesus to the religious leaders of 30-some-ish AD. We hear the same message from Paul to the first Christian religious leaders of 50-ish AD. Our early church fathers, we call them, they lived within one generation of Christ. They knew him or they knew someone who knew him. And they were a lot more open to mystery than we are today, I'd like to point out. Paul gives this message to us as well today and our Christian leaders. And that's why I find it so interesting that what God finds repulsive is not 
what we tend to focus on too heavily. Our religious leaders seem more interested in what they find repulsive. Those things are certainly easier to control, manipulate, and make rules for. For instance, it's easier to address the passage in here about drunk priests or drunk people if you just attack and judge consumption issues rather than heart issues. But let me ask you this. Is it really easier to believe that if you just avoided the alcohol, you'd be better off? Maybe, in some cases. Our current culture is filled with young people who are choosing sobriety and awesome, good for them. I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. But I have noticed it doesn't seem to be slowing down the selfishness and narcissism in our society. So in verse 15, the civil leaders have worked out their own plan. You boast, we have entered into a covenant with death, with the grave, Sheol. We have made an agreement. Scholars have theories about what this is in reference to, the tribes working out a deal with another powerful culture to protect them from the Assyrians when they come in, telling God, hey, we got it covered, man. We're good. We're, we're going to be all right. Possible necromancy uh, and worship of idols. Whatever the case, I think it does seem clear that this agreement is someone we've heard about throughout the Romans series. That's a little individual called Mises. And that is worship of an idol. And it's motivated by fear and shame. It feeds egos. I think this agreement in our current culture might even look like being motivated by division. Raising my group over yours. Turning my back on people who don't think like me. Well, Jesus is motivated by hope. And Jesus in you annuls your agreement with Sheol. And that annulment, it's going to hurt. Karl Barth, Peter has mentioned before, he was a Swiss theologian and was active for the First and Second World Wars. He's best known for his epistle to the Romans, he wasn't very popular. Uh, I took some seminary classes from at a popular seminary in town. You might be able to guess the name. And he wasn't very popular there. And I, I wondered why at the time. I didn't really get it. Um, if you got an S News, I hope the inserts made it in. I did print this for you. You have a printed copy of it because it's a lot of reading. So you're welcome to read that. I'm going to just hop in here and see if I put a copy in here for myself. Ah, here we go. Okay, so this is a portion of Bart's uh, um, epistle to the Romans. It's a commentary on Romans, and it's titled The Crisis of Knowledge. And I'm going to read it to you. So this is about the passage, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, the only one the, the, and only he that believeth on it shall not be put to shame. The stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, which is, however, at the same time the precious cornerstone laid in Zion, is Christ Jesus. In him, God reveals himself inexorably as the hidden God, who can be apprehended only indirectly. In him, he conceals himself utterly in order that he may manifest himself to faith only. In him, he makes known his infinite love by allowing the miracle of his freedom and his kingdom to be proclaimed with penetrating absence of all ambiguity. He that is of the true, uh, he that is of the truth heareth his voice, and yet who is of the truth? Who sees God as he is? Who does not advance a thousand excuses for keeping out of his way? We do not endure the truth. Indeed, we are, indeed, were we to endure it, our endurance would be itself the miracle. And through it, the truth would save us from the misery of our createdness. Well, if this cannot take place because we are not open to the miracle of the truth or ready for it, the truth will bring us under judgment with any miracle, simply by its own inner logic 
And so in the full course of their pursuit after the finite goal, which they define as faith, righteousness, love, and God, men, people, mankind, must be put to shame. In the midst of Zion, in the midst of this earthly heaven, God has set the fact of his eternity and has uttered the truth that he is found by grace and must be sought in eternity. When this offense and scandal is encountered, only the believer will not be put to shame. He that follows after but does not believe will inevitably gather nothing but empty nuts. He will run like a man who charges up a blind alley. Panicked, if you will. Hastily. And so there breaks forth the crisis of knowledge and the catastrophe of religion. There is no avoiding the shame and nakedness which accompany an impracticable understanding, undertaking. The church of Esau is and remains what it is. It must nail Christ in its only hope to the cross. There is no alternative when men do not joyfully accept the divine order, whereby God chooses us and not we him. They must inevitably overthrow it. However apparent the failings of the church may be, its superficiality and dullness, its worldliness and its asceticism, its useless humility and its equally useless pride, its misplaced zeal and trivial matters, and its equally misplaced and helpless unconcern with the things of existence and non-existence. These and many other accusations which may be brought against the church will not be sufficient to secure its condemnation were it not that it stood already condemned by its future, by its failure, sorry, to accept the judgment pronounced over men as men before ever they have, been, they have committed this or that offense or failed in this or that particular. Were the church to appear before men as a church under judgment, did it know of no other justification save that which is in judgment? Did it believe in the stone of stumbling and rock of offense instead of being offended and scandalized at it? Then, with all its failings and offenses, and certainly one day purified of some of them, it would be the church of God. The church, however, which sings its triumphs and, rim and trims and popularizes and modernizes itself in order to minister to and satisfy every need except the one, the church which, in spite of many exposures, is still satisfied with itself and, like Quicksilver, still seeks to find its own level. Such a church can never succeed, be it never so zealous, never so active in ridding itself of its failings and blemishes. With or without offenses, it can never be the church of God because it is ignorant of the meaning of repentance. I see why it wasn't very popular. But I think that his message is so relevant to us today and to each of us today, not just to the institutional church, but to each individual because, well, we'll get there. It's important to realize, though, that peace is now. Peace has to be now. The peace that passes all understanding is available to us all, always. It's at hand. It requires surrender, however. The death of ego, death to self, the death of Mises. We are all ambassadors of hope in our space-time. We are the temple of God. Our old earthen vessels are vessels of mercy. The simplicity of this is clear as often as it is impossible to grasp. It's quite frankly a mystery and maybe one that's better left unsolved. We humans are addicted to mysteries. They're everywhere. Books, magazines, TV shows, movies, podcasts, video games. I'm sure I'm missing tons of other places. And we're very driven to solve them. But some mysteries, I think, are better left unsolved. So I encourage you to resist the temptation to solve the mystery of God and simply live it. Live in the mystery of God. Mises puts us to shame. Certainty in place of mystery puts us to shame. It's the difference between surrender and control. Having to be right versus being curious and active listening. Our culture is addicted to being right many times with insufficient evidence. 
Vengeance versus scandalous grace and mercy. Who's familiar with the movie, the John Wick series? Only a couple. All right. I'm not suggesting it, so don't go out and watch it because I brought it up. Uh, There's a fourth one coming out, and I'll just say that I I looked at my daughter when we walked into the movie theater and said, John Wick 4, who's left? Because John Wick is a story, it's a graphic, horrific story of vengeance, and this man is a a killer. So John Wick is um, a well-recognized killer, right? A, A contract killer, and he has retired in the first movie. This is in the first one. So he retired from the life of crime that he lived. He got married, had a wife, lived a good four years, had an agreement to not be bothered by the people from the old world. His wife contracted a terminal disease and died. And a day after she died, I think it was the day that he went to the funeral, he came home and a dog was delivered to his house with a note from her that said, I'm sorry that this disease has separated us, but you still need something to practice loving, right? So you can start with this. And he has a beagle now, and he's not really excited about it. Well, he has a bump in with somebody from the old world who doesn't know who he is. They decide they want to steal his car. They show up at his house. They beat him up. They kill his dog, and they take his car. Well, this brings John out of retirement, which doesn't bode well for anybody in the rest of the movie because he goes on a horrific scene of vengeance, killing spree to to go make this right. Um, But I bring that up because of the quote that I want to share with you that, so John eventually gets on the phone with the crime boss. The crime boss finds out somebody has awoken John Wick and he's like, oh man, this is not going to end well. So he tries to call John. John just hangs up, doesn't talk to him. John decides to call him later, and he, su- he tells him, when Helen died, I lost everything. Until that dog arrived on my doorstep, a final gift from my wife. In that moment, I received some semblance of hope, an opportunity to grieve on alone. And your son took that from me. So yeah, I'm back, and I'm coming. And that concept of some semblance of hope is what I played on for this message because it, it brought to mind for me Charlotte's Web because I'm a weird person. And, uh, and the sign that says some pig, right? And we're some a semblance of hope. That's what we are here. And that's what we are doing together. We're, we're some a semblance of hope. So let me be clear. I'm not recommending either that you watch John Wick or that vengeance is the answer and that you go on a John Wick style uh, expedition because that's Mises. Instead, what I'd love to see is if you could love your neighbor with that kind of ferocity, with a John Wick ferocity, the kind of ferocity with which I imagine you love yourself. I have a good friend who's good friends with a lot of you. And I always liked the email tagline that this person had, but it morphed recently. And I think the morph is an example of an edit that made it more powerful and made it better. So it used to read at the end of every email you received from this person, love your neighbor and then we'll talk theology. The edit now reads, love your neighbor, period. Peter preached a sermon in the the Roman series called Why You Don't Have to Go to Church. It was a great sermon, unless you work for a church. (laughs) But it's true. It is true. The church, the body of Christ, is bigger than this gathering. But I did want to spend a little bit of time telling you why it's so great when you do come to church. And for a long time, this was just something I struggled to understand. I still struggle to understand it. Because Heather and I had a hard time making it to church a lot of times. And when I did, I noticed there's just something different about coming here and being together. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it. I I just can't. But there's something different. I've never gone home after coming to be together with you guys and said, man, I really wish I hadn't gone there today. 
This body offers a place for you to worship with others, unalone, right? That's what, that's what Wick saw in the hope of that dog. He could love, he could heal unalone. We can worship together, and that's healing, unalone. The bigger, more interesting underlying story in this world is not division. It's communion. It's worship together. It's surrender together. It's fellowship together. Nothing turns your celebration meal as quickly as vomit on the table. We talked about that in verse 8 in Isaiah, that there's vomit on the table. The translations get really graphic with that. But the point that they're trying to make is there's no place on the table not covered. There's no clean place left. They didn't have communion tables, but... The tables do represent communion, togetherness, worship. See, I believe that the great redemption is lived out day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, face to face. Real revival comes out of those moments, those exchanges, those interactions. Heather and I's experience with the meal train that Tracy set in motion for us was amazing. And I thank you all so much for the, the love that poured out in those meals, <laughs> literally, and some of them, they were soups. So, um, but it, it just was really fantastic. And, um, and I know there are countless stories like that, but we really appreciated it. And we felt loved and we felt um, well loved. Being the body requires recognizing that seemingly small things matter. It's how endurance is created. Maybe nobody will notice if you pass on a small prompting, a small thing. But somebody will notice if you act on that small thing. And that action will produce character in you while it produces endurance in someone else as you support them. So you all know we have a book club and I've done a lot of reading and I apologize. We're going to do a little bit more. In the book club, we read a book called The Death of Ivan Ilyich, which was by Leo Tolstoy. And um, Ivan is poor and dreams of being wealthy. He slides into a life of wealth, becomes successful and quite miserable. He contracts a terminal illness, mainly because he's in a Russian novel and he has to die. Uh, and we find him in this passage doing quite poorly. He said to himself, go on, batter me. But what for? What have I done to you? What is it? Four. Then he grew quiet, stopped crying and even breathing, and grew all attention, as though he were listening not to voice speaking in sounds, but the voice of his soul, the train of his thoughts rising inside him. What do you want? Was the first clear notion he heard, which he put, could put into words. What do you want? What do you need? He repeated to himself. What? Not to suffer, but to live, he replied. And again, he gave himself over to such tense attention that even his pain did not distract him. Live? Live how? asked the voice of his soul. Yes, live like I did before, well and pleasantly. Oh, like you lived before, well and pleasantly, asked the voice. And in his imagination, he began going over the best moments of his pleasant life, his, his wealthy life. But how strange, all those best moments of his pleasant life now seemed quite different from what they had seemed then. Everything except the first memories of his childhood there in his childhood was something really pleasant that you could live with if it were to come again. But the person who had experienced that happy time was no more. It was like a memory of another person. About a month or maybe a little longer than that later, the doctor announces to his family that his physical suffering has become intense. And that was true. But his spiritual suffering was worse. And that was what tormented him most of all. His spiritual suffering lay in the fact that during the night, looking in the face of his servant, kind, sleepy face with its high cheekbones, it suddenly occurred to him, what if in reality the whole of my life, my conscious life, was not done, not the right thing? It occurred to him that what had previously seemed to him a downright impossibility, that he had lived his whole life not as he should, could actually be true. It occurred to him that his barely recognized promptings to fight against what people in the highest positions deemed good, faintly perceptible impulses, which he had promptly shrugged off. It could be these that were the reality, and all the rest was not the right thing. 
and his work and the construction of his life and his family and those social and professional interests, all of them might not be the right thing. He tried to defend all these things to himself and suddenly felt all the feebleness of what he was defending. And there was nothing to defend. Well, we offer a place to collectively surrender ourselves and to connect to the source of those faintly perceptible impulses. We also offer opportunities to love our neighbors together if you're looking for those. I'm working to get our deacon ministry back up and running. Um, If you're interested in becoming a deacon, please call or email me and let me know. I'd love to meet with you so that we can talk about what that means and we can uh, institute a team of deacons that will oversee some of the giving and some of the things, the ministries in the church. We have a couple interested already, but if you're interested, I'd love to hear from you. If that sounds like too much, you'd like to know if there's something else that you'd like to help out with or, or there's something that you think of. We can use volunteers to help with youth. That It happens during service, during the, the message, so you'd miss the message if you did that, but you could do it once a month and then come back in to the message. If you want to help with the children's ministry, I know that Angie can use help. If you want to help with greeting people on Sundays, we, we haven't had greeters since our vacation from reality. Um, and so as we're rebuilding, we'd like to have greeters again to, to welcome people as they come to church. If you want to help set up lunch and clean up lunch on a regular basis, I, everyone is so awesome that you pitch in and do that now without a structure, without, but if we want to, if, if you feel like that's something you're gifted in and you want to help in that way, then, then the, let me know. If you want to lead a social group, Maybe you have something that you like to do that you'd like to do with some others. We could, uh, you'd be fully in charge of what it looked like. It's your activity and you're just doing it with other people in the church. Then let me know. If you want to volunteer for a local missions organization, coming up soon, we're going to hear about some opportunities uh, for some groups that we have connections to inside the body already to help support those people and those connections. A couple of those would be Alternatives Pregnancy Center, Christ's Body, and Denver Rescue Mission. Or if there's something else you think of that you see that's missing, that you'd like to provide, reach out to me and let me know. Well, John Wick's dog provided him with some semblance of hope, and we here are some a semblance of hope. We worship together on a loan. I know it's a pain to leave your house. I get it. You have to get cleaned up and dressed, or at least you think you have to. One of my favorite phrases from the post-COVID world, I heard it and I thought, yes, I get that. You have to put on hard pants. It's (laughs) terrible. It's terrible. I know. Traffic sucks. I know. Parking is a challenge. I know. It's really hard. But it's so worth it. For some reason, it's easier to sacrifice your ego with others. It's easier to focus less on yourself when you focus on others. It's easier when you look into their eyes, when you share their life with them and you share your life with them. Church is just another place to be able to do that. To our abroad community, we're so glad to have you join us each week and worship with us. And we're so grateful. We greatly value you and our fellowship, and we want to encourage you to be the body where you are. We're looking into how we can help you all to connect with others physically, too as we head into 2023. Folks are leaving the evangelical Protestant church. They're leaving it in waves. You hear about it in the news now. It's actually making the news that churches are empty or folding. And they're in search of hope, I think. They're leaving the evangelical Protestant church in search of hope. Some are going to the Orthodox church Some are going to Catholic Church. Some are moving back to Anglican Church. Some are going to atheism. Some are turning to science purely, which I believe is a religion. The problem with that is Mises is there in all those structures too. And it won't take long to find him or her. The solution to our lack of hope is not to leave one group for another. The solution is not to take the ball home and stop passing it all together. 
early Romans reference. It, we need to keep passing the ball. We need to keep playing. We need to keep engaging. There's a cliche saying, be the change you want to see in the world, right? I don't know who said it. I don't care. But we need a less combative revolution. We need a love revolution. We need less seeking to be right. We need less seeking to push others down to raise ourselves up. We need more Christ-like people to step up. I want to leave you with a story that I wish I couldn't tell, but that I'm blessed to be able to. Mike Vaughn was a member of the junior high youth group that Heather and I used to lead at the turn of the century, if you can believe that. It sounds so long ago. Mike was quiet, kind, and an oracle of sorts. One of those guys that's got a lot going on inside, and when he spoke up, it would really make you think. Growing up, the middle brother of five... Mike had a very active family life. He went on to become a beloved teacher and a coach at A. West. Mike was diagnosed with terminal cancer and fought a long battle against it. But during that battle, he never lost hope. And I'm going to read to you one last thing, I apologize, from his wife's post on Facebook after Mike passed. Because I think Mike gave a better example than Ivan, and a more hopeful example. To all our family, friends, and friends of friends, I wanted to share with you that Mike passed away this morning. He is now living free of pain and surrounded by love in heaven. Because Mike is Mike, I wanted to share some things helping me process and have peace. One. When we found out that our good friend passed away a year ago, Mike's first response was, right on, he's in heaven. I am taking that same attitude with his passing. Number two, days before he passed, he said, if I am coherent at all tomorrow, I want to die by Jim's Burger Haven's triple meat and cheese. Number three, I asked him if he would go through it all again, cancer, the treatments, he said, yes, as hard as it is saying that to you, I think it has saved you and others by bringing them to the Lord. God has used me in my life to save others. For our kids, it will build them up more than tear them down. If I have to sacrifice my life to save them, I would do it any day. I would rather lay down my life to give them a chance at theirs. And number four, like no other person I have met, Mike loved others. He got to really know and relate to his students and athletes. He saw past their behavior and into their hearts, see, seeing good. He believed developing relationships with hard-to-reach kids was the best kind of support. He is the best, and I am so glad to have spent so much time learning from him. Thank you to everyone who has helped us through the very difficult season. I really suck at sending thank yous. But please know we have never felt more loved or more seen than we have during the last couple of years. I'm so grateful and touched for all the fundraisers, support from the GoFundMe, prayers, meals, and memories. God has really blessed our family with hope, peace, and so much love through this difficult journey. You are all evidence of this. I love you, Mike, for all the days of my life. Um, there's a picture of Mike with his family, his, his wife, Amber, and his kids, Bria and Noel, Noel, or, yeah, Noel and Ike. And I know this was really hard on his family, his, his mom, Maria, his dad, Chuck, his brothers, Travis, Josh, Taylor, Tanner. But he showed people how to truly live, even in death, in the face of certain death, in the face of a defined date. We all live in the face of death but sometimes it just becomes a little more real for us. He showed us how to truly live, not just be alive. Unlike Ivan Ilovich, 
Mike spent his life listening for the faintly perceptible impulses, embracing them with vigor, eager for the opportunities that unfolded from them. Did he have tough times? Oh, you bet he did. I know Mike went through very difficult times. But he was an example of someone living in the obedience of faith. Obedience without faith is death, is dead. Which brings us back to the final verses of Romans. Close your eyes for me. You can click your heels together if you want to, but you don't have to recite. There's no place like home. But I'm going to get us back out of Romans. But listen to Paul's closing. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You don't need a seminary degree to love God with your whole being. You don't need a seminary degree to love God, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Many of the early church fathers who formed our modern theology didn't have one. Truth matters, don't get me wrong, but I think life matters more. So do me a favor, turn to a neighbor, be face to face, eye to eye for a minute. I'm not going to make you kiss. I'm not Peter. Peter doesn't have a neighbor, so I'll do it with you. And just say to your neighbor, I don't need to understand God to share him with you. I don't need to understand God to share him with you. And now neighbor, say it back to your neighbor. <laughs> I don't need to understand God. <laughs> we went both times. Remember that. And let's commune with the spirit of our daddy. Oh, this mess. I'll clean this mess up. And on the night he was betrayed by all of us, Jesus took the bread from the table and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Eat and do it in remembrance of me. And likewise, after giving thanks, took the cup of wine and said, this is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Drink it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. And now listen for his faintly perceptible impulses. Surrender to them and rejoice.
All right, well, I have to apologize. I kept you for a long time, and that was a lot of reading, and so I hope it was good for you. Uh, it was good for me, and I'm just looking for my benediction. So this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We are entering into the Lenten season, so I would level a challenge to you to consider, whether you're Catholic or not, giving something up for Lent. Um, it's not just dogma. It's not, it's not just church policy. It's actually controlled suffering. So um, it, it's just for a time, and it's just temporal, but it is a real focusing reminder of the bigger story that's at work, the story of redemption. So I encourage you to join us this Wednesday night for our experiential Ash Wednesday service. You can kick off whatever it is you gave up and miss it for 40 days. So know that you're in good company. I'm not going to read to you the final passage of Scripture. I'll let you read it on your own. But Paul uses this term one, once again uh, of being put to shame in 1 Corinthians. And it's in, I don't know, I, I would think it would be an embarrassing piece if he were still here today and he was like, really, you published that letter? You published that? Because he's telling them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he's explaining how the work of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And he talks about how God will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. He will thwart. And then he kind of mentally looks at his audience and says, well, take you guys. You guys are a good example. All of you, I am going to read it to you because it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty funny, I think. But for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Consider you all. Brothers and sisters, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even, these, even things that are not to bring to nothing, brings that are what? All right. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. <laughs>